Welcome to St. John's Lutheran Church, Springfield, Ohio. We're located at 27 North Wittenberg Avenue, across from Springfield Regional Hospital. Uh, this is our Good Friday service, uh, April 3rd, 2015. You're listening to the Bell Choir. The service will be performed by P Pastor John Pollock. The bell choir and the choir are led by our choir director, Vicki Perks. Organist is Greg Nolte. O oh Lord, open my lips. Make haste, O oh God, to deliver me. Make haste to open me, Lord. Praise to you, O Christ, and salvation. You may be seated as we sing Jesus, I will honor now, hymn number 345, in the back of your worship. Hymn number 345.
seed, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up, and shall be very high. Just as there were many who were astonished at him, so far was his appearance beyond the resemblance, and his form beyond that of mortals. So he shall start many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him. For that which had not been told them, they shall see. And that which they had not heard, they shall contemplate. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity. And as one from whom others hid their face, he was despised and we held him of no account. Surely he was born of our infirmities and carried our diseases, yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed our iniquities. Upon him was a punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, and we all turn to our own ways. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. Like a perversion of justice, he was taken away. Who, had, who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, struck him for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich. Although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with the pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out himself to death, and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many, and made intercessions for the transgressors. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Please turn to Psalm 22 in the middle of the hymn. Psalm 22. Becky Demetrio will be doing the song.
Regina Pollock will do the second reading. A reading from Hebrews. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, said the Lord. I will put my laws in their heart, and I will write them on their minds. He also adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he has opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, in order to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine was standing. So they put a sponge full of wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was a day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have a leg for the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified, so that you also may believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occur so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, They will look on the one whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices and linen cloths according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so because it was a Jewish day of preparation, and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there, the passion of our Lord. You may be seated.
returning to the first page of your bulletin. O Lord, have mercy on us. We have an advocate with the Father. Jesus is the atoning sacrifice for our sins. He was delivered up to death.
grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. For six hours, Jesus has been hanging on a cross. For three of those hours, he suffered at the hands of Satan and of humanity. And for three of those hours, he suffered separation from God. Now the separation is over, and he is back again in communion with God, his Father. And the change was like going from a hovel to a palace, from night into, or darkness into light, from hell to heaven. As now Jesus again feels that loving presence of his Father, and with confidence he can speak that last word from the cross. For during those six hours hanging on the cross, Jesus has already spoken six times. The first word was a word of forgiveness. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The second word was a word of compassion for a repentant sinner. As the one repentant criminal was crucified with him, asked Jesus to remember him and showed a belief in Jesus as the Savior of the world. And Jesus told him, today you, you will be with me in paradise. The third word from the cross was a word of concern. Jesus concerned for his mother Mary, the mother of our Lord. Concerned that she would not be left with no one to take care of her when Jesus died and then rose and ascended into heaven. And so seeing the disciple whom he loved, he said that I gave his mother over to the care of that disciple. And in so doing, gave to us a foreshadowing of what the Christian community should be like. That in the Christian community, all of us are brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, whether we are blood relative or not. But that in this community of faith, we take on that new brotherhood and sisterhood with one another, caring for one another, watching over one another, helping one another. And then came that fourth word from the cross. When Jesus had all the sin of the world piled upon, when at that moment Jesus became the sacrifice for all the sins that were being committed and would be committed until his return to glory. And at that moment he said that word of separation and abandonment. My God, my God, why has I forsaken? And we learned that God had to turn away from his son at that moment. Because God being a holy God cannot be in the presence of sin. And at that moment, Jesus was the sin of the world. All the sin of the world upon him. And so God had to turn away so that Jesus' death upon the cross would be the payment, the redeeming price, the atonement for the sins that we commit. Then, after that, we hear the fifth word from the cross, the only word in which Jesus requests something for himself. Jesus said, I thirst. A Roman soldier gives him a sour wine that was there for the soldiers to drink while they oversaw the crucifixion. And they moistened Jesus' lips and some of that sour wine went down his throat so that he could then yell the last two words from the cross. First of all, the sixth word, it is finished. That word we learned last night is not a statement of defeat, not a statement of despair, not a statement of throwing in the towel, but instead it's a shout of the victory. It is a victor shout of the one who crosses the finish line first in a race. It is the boxer or wrestler whose hand is held up in victory. And they shout, to tell us that it is accomplished. It is fulfilled. It is finished. And now with his last breath, Jesus gives that word which shows us that he now is back in the love of his father. And he said, we read in Luke 23, 46, Then Jesus, crying with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his life. From this final word on the cross, Jesus is teaching us a very important lesson. A lesson about a topic that a lot of people don't want to discuss. A topic that is often avoided. And that is with this seventh and final word from the cross. Jesus is teaching us 
as his followers how to know. Even though nearly 5,000 Americans die a day, most people are not interested in learning how to die. Most people are not even interested in talking about death because that's something in the future. And very few young people ever have death cross their mind. For when you're young, you think you're invincible. When you're young, you have your whole life ahead of you. When you're young, you have all kinds of goals to accomplish. So you don't think about death. Yet in 1990, a young man who was considered the best college basketball player that year, Hank Gathers, 23 years old, collapsed and died to the horror of a field auditorium watching him playing in a tournament leading up to the final four. Just 23 years old, a superb athlete, one who was supposed to be a champion collapsed and died in front of thousands of people watching that game. In Florida, there is a retirement community, some 5,000 people. Every month they issue a newsletter. But in that newsletter, they never put or never had a section for obituaries. You never know from one month to the next who has died. If you go away and you come back and you think some of your friends are there, you don't discover they're not there until you go looking for them and somebody tells you that they have passed away. Their reasoning is, they say, they want their retirement community to be a happy place. And death is not a happy subject. And so they act like it doesn't exist. Even though every day, members of that retirement community pass away. It is as important for us to know how to die as it is of how to live. That great Lydon hymn we sang last night, Holy Week hymn, Go to Dark Gethsemane. One of the standards are that go to Dark Gethsemane to learn from Jesus how to die. With the seventh word from the cross, Jesus is teaching us how to die. How to die in faith. How to die as a follower of Jesus Christ. How to die as a brother and sister of Jesus Christ. As a member of the community of faith. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. That word commit, it means to place something alongside something else. It means to present something to someone. It means to make a deposit as a trust or as a protection. It means to set forth something or to set something before someone. Jesus, with his death upon the cross, placed his spirit alongside the heavenly fathers so that he could die for the sins of the world. Jesus' death upon the cross presented to his Father the ultimate and complete sacrifice as the life of God who takes away the sin of the world and giving his spirit back to his Father accomplished that feat. Jesus deposited for our protection his spirit with the Father so that he could rise again from the dead on that third day and then 40 days later ascend into heaven and 10 days after that send the power of the Holy Spirit into the church on that first Pentecost. So that being filled with the Holy Spirit, we can boldly go out into the world, to the unchurched, to the unsaved, and share with him the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus' death, we must always remember, was voluntary. Nobody ripped his life away from him. Hank Gather's life was ripped away from him at 23 years old. He didn't die voluntarily. The 5,000 or so Americans who died today or will die before the day is over. They are not dying voluntarily. Their lives are being ripped from them. But Jesus voluntarily gave up his life so that he would be the acceptable sacrifice to his father. So that we might be his own and live under him in his kingdom. His death was voluntary so that we would receive all the grace that God has for us. He set himself before the Father 
so that when the Father looks at us, He does not see our sin, but He sees a child of His heavenly King. When He looks at us, He sees a child washed in the blood of the Lamb, His Son, Jesus Christ. And so Jesus willingly commits Himself back to the Father so that we might have victory over sin and death and the power of the devil. And Jesus says, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. He is showing us that to die is to die in faith. Jesus had faith in God as Father. Well. Jesus had faith in the mission that God sent him to earth to fulfill. Jesus had faith that his Father would sustain him and give him the strength to undergo that passionate, horrible death on the cross. He had faith that on that third day he would rise, and that 40 days later he would ascend into heaven where he waits to come again and judge the living and the dead. He had faith in his Father that he would send the Holy Spirit so that the church would be empowered by that Holy Spirit and be empowered with an evangelistic zeal to share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ for the Jesus died in faith and as his followers following his example we die in faith in Jesus Christ. We die in faith in Jesus Christ, faith in his promise that he goes to prepare a place for us. Dying in that faith that we will have everlasting life. That when we die, the scripture tells us our soul immediately goes back to the Father, to the glory of that eternal kingdom. We die in faith, trusting that we are going home to our Lord Jesus Christ. Two men lived on opposite sides of town. One man lived in the rich section of town, lived in a gated community, a big fancy house, had four or five cars in the garage, had a big boat out on the lake that was a few miles north of town. He had a summer home somewhere else in the United States, Ate at the best restaurants, wore the fanciest, most expensive suits, shirts, ties, and shoes and socks. The other man lived in the working class section of town. He worked hard to scratch out a living for himself and his family. But he was very active, as was his family in church. He taught Sunday school. He was an usher. He was a deacon. The rich man never darkened the door of the church even on Christmas or Easter. He didn't have time for church. He had other things that were more important. Well, it just so happened that both men were dying on the same day. As a rich man lay dying in his big fancy bed with his silk sheets and silk pillowcases and his several hundred dollars silk pajamas covered in his body, as his family gathered close with his last breath, they heard him mumble mournfully, I'm leaving home. I'm leaving home. Across town, in the working man's humble home, lying in his humble bed with his Kmart pajamas covering his body, his family gathered around him to hear his last breath and heard him say, I'm going home. I'm going home. With Jesus' seventh word from the cross, he assures us that when we die, we die in that faith that we are going home. That we are going home to that permanent residence. Going home to that mansion he prepares for us himself. I've mentioned to you before that one of the experiences I gained at Griffith Luther Church was being next to being next to Gary. Oftentimes, I uh, would supply preach at some of the Lutheran churches in Gary. In fact, was vacancy pastor of the All Black Gary Lutheran Church, Calvary Lutheran Church in Gary. And I had the opportunity to go to a number of African American funerals. And the one thing I noticed, and I think I've shared this with you before, is that an African American funeral, you go into church and every funeral service has a bulletin of some sort, a program. On the front of it says, homecoming service for, and usually there's a picture of the deceased and their name. 
homecoming service. When we had the LBW, when you had a funeral in the church, you turned to page 200, whatever it was, and said, Burial of the Dead. Now with our red book, we have a funeral in church. You turn to the liturgy, it says, Funeral.
Jesus died with complete trust in God. We die with complete trust in Jesus Christ. All because Jesus was willing to do it all so that we might be his own and live under him in his kingdom. So it is important that we learn from Jesus Christ how to die. And it is important that we live as children of the Heavenly Father, proclaiming that good news of Jesus Christ. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us now sing, Alas, and did my Savior bleed, hymn number 337, in the back of our worship. Thank you. 
temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, graciously behold this your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and delivered into the hands of sinful men to suffer death upon the cross. Do the same, Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Let us pray. We implore you, O Lord, that your abundant blessing may be upon your people who have held the passion, beheld the passion and death of your Son in devout remembrance, that we may receive your pardon and the gift of your comfort, and may increase in faith and take hold of eternal salvation. Do the same, Jesus Christ, your Son, O Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you will that your Son should bear for us the pains of the cross, and so remove from us the power of the adversary. Help us so to remember and give thanks for our Lord's passion, that we may receive forgiveness of sin and redemption from everlasting death, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Salvation of the whole world. 